It's becoming one of the hippest pastimes, rapidly growing in popularity. It's even being credited with helping lift the New York City economy. It might be hard to believe, but we're talking about bowling. It was the great American pastime. Family friendly, squeaky clean, and faintly nerdy. But bowling has experienced a major turnaround, thanks in large part to the skyrocketing success of Bowmore Lanes, a chain of bowling alleys scoring around the country. Welcome to Bloomberg Enterprise, where we profile businesses as they scale up. Bowling used to be associated with suburban leagues with their names scrawled across their shirts. But those days are long gone. Now that one of the world's oldest pastimes has experienced a revival, launched by modern day kingpin Tom Shannon and his string of bowling alley entertainment centers. We do a lot of corporate, a lot of private events, a lot of bar mitzvahs, believe it or not. And then some big interesting things like, you know, play or movie launches, product launches, things like that. How do you explain the universal appeal of bowling? I mean, at the, at the end of the day, it's people just throwing a ball into some wooden bags. You know, you're 100% right, and I think that its simplicity is a big part of the appeal because everyone can do it, and we get to sit around in this comfortable area and watch someone do it either well or badly, but hopefully in a, in a funny way if it's bad, and everyone can do it. So, you know, it's one of those timeless activities, and I think that there's an element of nostalgia as well. What made you think that you could take this sort of old, fuddy-duddy sport and make it hip and cool? <laughs> well, I guess it was ironic. And I think that it plays best in areas where it's ironic. So I don't think our model would work very well in Des Moines, where you have bowling everywhere and it's $2. So no one's going to say, wow, I should pay $5 for it. But in New York or Orange County, California, or Silicon Valley, for example, it's ironic because you, can, you take people who rarely do the sport, right? Think of it as this, you know, old man's league activity, and you make it relevant for them, and they love it because it's ironic. So, do you think people are coming here tongue-in-cheek to bowl, or are they taking it seriously? Oh, definitely the former. I mean, I don't think anyone takes bowling seriously. Why would you? This is his latest crowning achievement, Bowmore Lanes in Manhattan's Times Square, a 90,000-square-foot, $25 million entertainment mecca in the New York Times building. It features a real-time sports ticker, four floors of stadium seating, 29 high-def screens, and gourmet cuisine by celebrity chef David Burke. This is an ode to New York, and this is the first of many. Of course, when you have 90,000 square feet and the way this is broken up in different areas, you know, it was a challenge that we turned into an opportunity. And so you don't have all the lanes laid out in a row. You've got them set up in little rooms. Times Square in the 60s. So we replicated actual signage that existed in Times Square in the 60s throughout the space. Then upstairs, it's periods of time, so Art Deco, Prohibition, pop, art on the walls, the, the fixtures, which are actually antique light fixtures, the, the Lucite fans, and we commissioned the world's only black bowling lanes. If Chinatown, heavily themed, Coney Island and Central Park, the stadium grill, we'd never done a big dining facility like this, um, so we enlisted the help of celebrity chef David Burke. Food's great and innovative and quirky. How much does it cost to open up one of these massive high-end bowling alleys? The one you're sitting in costs about $26 million. Well, what kind of revenue are you seeing? It's pretty good. It's pretty good. Can you tell us? Um, A range. You know, 15 to 20 million. Per bowling alley? Well, for this one. Yeah. Yeah. It varies. I mean, you go from a very small unit in Bethesda to, to this, and it's a very different revenue model. You know, I think it's what's more interesting is returns. So the, the model generates a 35 to 40 percent return on equity. And how do you break that down? Simple. The first year cash flow divided by your equity investment in the project. Okay. And, and that's how we measure success. So what kind of returns are we getting? And I think they're as good as anyone's we've heard in, the, in leisure and hospitality. That, that's what we benchmark.
And we, we define our business very simply. We say we're in the business of cost effectively creating customer evangelists. Simple. And so it's about happiness. You know, people come here and we manufacture happiness. And so you need. It's ambitious. Well, maybe, or incredibly simple. I mean, isn't that sort of what business is in the business of doing? Like, if your product doesn't delight, like, why do you exist? And we don't serve any need. I mean, I suppose there's a societal need for recreation, but you can do that in a lot of ways, right? We see the customer experiences starting with the design and then the product offerings, the food and the beverage, et cetera, and then, of course, the service. They all three ideally weave themselves together so that you come in and you just have a great time and you tell your friends and you come back. So if it's all about delight, what are your most delightful aspects? <laughs> um, the beauty of bowling is that anyone can do it. It doesn't require any particular skill set. So you can bowl a 30 and have as great a time as someone who bowls a 250. So there's a real philosophy behind it. You know, I didn't go in knowing this, but I discovered it along the way. You know, and, and as the business grew from a million dollars to close to 50, um, you know, you go, wow, why is this working so well? And you realize that some of it has to do with, with what we're doing, and a lot of it has to do with just the inherent goodness of the activity. If people weren't into it, if they didn't like it, we couldn't fix that. But it just works. More on Baltimore's history when we come back. Bowling's rebirth dates back to 1994. Tom Shannon was a recent MBA grad looking to start his own business. He was at a birthday party at the original Bullmore Lanes in New York City's Union Square, a 50-year-old business that was slowly crumbling. I got invited to a party there. I was living on the Upper East Side. I had no idea where University Place was. I pulled out this little tourist map and I went down and I came into this thing that I can only characterize as a glorious anachronism. You know, 40,000 square feet, everything was either fake wood paneling or painted gray. <laughs> you know, it was completely unique in New York. So I fell in love with it. it took a while, but uh, three years later, I was able to buy it. And being completely broke, um, the deal was 3,000 down, 2 million borrowed. No, wow. Yeah. How'd you get that deal? Well, uh, there were a couple of different tranches in the capital structure. Um, the sellers took back about two thirds of the purchase price in a seller note that was subordinate to everyone else. I was able to get some SBIC debt on top of them and then um, twisted some arms and got in some friends and family money, a little bit. So you raised money from your friends and family? Yeah, a little bit. And what did you tell them? That was the fun part because here you had this completely dilapidated bowling alley that was actually losing money. And you had to convince them, here's the vision. You know, you're in this amazing market with this unique property, so let's just make it relevant. I was 31 at the time, so the business plan was simple. Make this place appeal to a 31-year-old. The original Bulmar has this incredible history, and Richard Nixon himself actually bowled here? Nixon, back in the 50s, when he was vice president, bowled at Bulmar. And in the 70s, it was this rock and roll hangout, you know, and you had everyone, like the Rolling Stones and the Stray Cats, and on and on. Um, been there since 38, and it's kind of cool because it really reflects New York history in every era. Like in the 40s, people used to bowl all night, and they had blackout curtains over the windows, right, in case there was a, a German, you know, bomber wow. looking for New York, right? So it's unique, and I think that's really why I fell in love with it. When I found it, I said, you know, this really is New York. Back then it was, it was gritty New York, and then it became more stylish New York and but yeah it's cool that it's been there since 38. Shannon crunched the numbers and realized he could overhaul the business, appeal to an upscale clientele and charge more. And what gave you the idea to think that you would be able to turn it around? Well the financial performance was so distressed from from bad management that it wasn't like you had to do some heroic re-engineering of the business to make it work. It was simply make it relevant. So, for example, there was no kitchen. There was no tap beer. They didn't take credit cards. They didn't have a fax machine. So a lot of it was basic management. But I sensed that there was an opportunity to do something that would resonate with New Yorkers that wasn't the traditional bar restaurant scene. 
So here we have this huge asset in a great location. Let's just make it cool. Let's make it relevant. Right, like you could pay $1 for a cup of coffee or you could pay $5 at Starbucks. What makes people pay more? It's the same thing with this bowling. 100%. And the model is pretty simple because people love to bowl. We didn't have to convince people they like to bowl. But the problem was in the traditional bowling business, the wrapper, the surrounding around the bowling was so unappealing. You know, like no service, bad food, you know, the greasy hot dog on the roller, or stale nachos, tap beer. So we said, okay, people love to bowl. The bowling's there, that's easy. Now let's surround it with a service intensive environment and give people the product they want. Emboldened by the Union Square location success, Shannon expanded the concept nationwide. He started to buy and renovate bowling alleys across the country, turning them into edgy, stylish entertainment centers. That was, that was the scariest thing I ever did was going from Union Square that worked and saying, okay, does it work because people love the concept of, of high style bowling or does it work because it's in Union Square and it's been there since 1938, right? The big unknown. And it just so happened that a deal came across my plate in Bethesda, Maryland, and I grew up in the D.C. area, so I knew the market. The economics were, were pretty attractive, so I took the risk. And it worked great. And then we said, okay, we're in the growth business. So how is this venue different from your other ones around the country? They're all different. Um, they're all distinctive and tailored to the communities they're in. So Orange County has a wall of surfboards, for example. And Cupertino and Silicon Valley is Asian inspired. So we have this inverted wooden trellis that runs the whole length of the property. Which one's your most profitable? Um, well, this one's new, but my guess is this will end up being the most profitable. Do you ever worry you'd become spread too thin? Not really, because we, we've grown at a pretty measured pace. If you think about doing six deals over 14 years, that's pretty moderate growth. But they're big, complicated deals. So we're not going to open 30 units this year. We might open one unit. And you can devote the entire resources of the organization when you're growing at a measured pace. And so the risk of growth for us is not very significant. Still to come. Each time we do this, we add about 100 full-time jobs. And there's all the economic activity related to building this. Bullmore Lanes estimates the revenue from its Times Square operation alone is near $20 million. But in a way, it's this fabulous revenue model because even though they cost a lot to build, the bowling alleys sort of operate themselves. There's not a lot of overhead. Uh, yes and no. I mean, there's no variable cost to a game of bowling. So the, the economics of the sport are quite attractive, but there's a lot of fixed costs. I mean, you don't even want to know what the rent is here, right? And plus, you need a lot of management to be able to execute at a high level. So it's a good economic model, and it generates good returns, but you have to be very selective where you do it. And one of the big takeaways is that we, like one of our core values is, is great design, and I love design, but what we found is that the customer isn't willing to pay for design at the margin. So if you look around here, there's, there's a tremendous amount of design detail. The reality is, is the customer doesn't notice a lot of it, and so you have to be really prudent in how you deploy capital because you're not going to get paid for those incremental dollars beyond a certain point. Interesting. They may not notice every little detail, they just know they like it in general. Right. Let's just say that the difference between our, our model and the traditional bowling model is um, you could build a traditional bowling alley for $5 million. You could build one of our typical prototypes for about $8 million, and the only difference between the 5 and the 8 is design because all the infrastructure is the same, right? So how much more is the customer willing to pay for all of that design? That's the calculus. Now you must have had a lot of roadblocks, stumbling blocks along the way. What were some of them? Capital. You know, every time you need capital, it's, um, you're, you're going begging. And you think, you're gonna, you think you outgrow that at some point. And I'm sure you do, but we've never... You yeah, haven't done it We yet. haven't reached that point yet. And it's, it's a problem for society because we have a, a demonstrated model that works and generates good returns. More importantly... Each time we do this, we add about 100 full-time jobs, and there's all the economic activity related to building this. So 
we spent $26 million in the local New York economy on labor and stuff to build this. We pay big rents. We pay enormous sales taxes, property taxes, all that other stuff. Hugely beneficial for society when we open a property. Cost of capital at this point is probably so high that I won't do another project until the cost of capital comes down. Where do you get the capital from? I mean, you have to generate it out of cash flow at this point. For us, at this point in our, in our cycle, the calculus is, do you reinvest those proceeds and continue to grow, or do you pay down debt? If your cost of debt is high enough, you have a zero risk, high return simply by paying down debt. Is that good for society? No. Is it good for your business? Probably yes. Is it interesting, fun, and sexy? Absolutely not, but that's the cycle we're in. Who have some of your investors been in the past? Oh, I mean, we have a private equity firm that owns about 30% of the company, and they've been a great partner. Um, uh, and we've had a, a lender, you know, for about the last eight years. But there was one very public stumble. It was disclosed Yasser Arafat had invested in the company. The Jewish community in New York was up in arms. Tom Shannon says the whole thing was misreported, a giant misunderstanding. But he still gave back the money. Wasn't Arafat. What happened was, um, back in, in the Clinton days, the U.S., the European Union, and Israel put money into a Palestinian pension fund for the purposes of Palestinian nation building. So it was basically the Palestinian Social Security Fund that had invested in a number of funds around the world including in this fund in Virginia. The transaction was blessed by the State Department and the Department of Treasury on two different occasions. That money ended up in our company, some of the money. It was a big fund, a small part ended up, along with, as I said, two U.S. billionaires and an investment bank. So the story was completely misreported. Um, it blew over, and I don't think it cost us much more than, than a little bit of heartburn and, and stuff like that. Turns out there was nothing nefarious or illegal about this in any way, but, you know, it's a question we've had to answer. Now you have so much competition from all of these high-end bowling alleys. That must frustrate you. The reality is, is that while there were a lot of competitors and people were doing deals, no one has done a deal in a while because everyone faces the same capital constraints that we do. So I think that's less of an issue for us going forward. But we've always been prudent. We have a pretty good balance sheet. So when, when the time is right, we'll be in growth mode. And I think some of our competitors won't be in that position. Has the increase of competition changed things for you? Yeah, it has in, in, in a positive way and in a negative way. In a positive way, I was very slow to grow the concept. And we learned from our competitors when, when they came out and started aggressively doing deals. Not only that there was probably a broader market receptivity and we should really think about growing, but the other thing was the economics of the deals they were doing were better than the economics of the deals we were doing hmm. because I didn't really understand how much willingness there was on the part of landlords to, to do tenant, tenant allowance, right? Because the deals we were doing were typically existing bowling alleys or had been uh, bowling alleys before that were now defunct. And going into new projects, landlords are willing to put up a significant part of the, of the construction cost. And when I saw my competitors doing those deals, it made the economics of our deals much more attractive because they went from being all equity deals to, to much, more, uh, much more capital efficient deals. So that, that was the positive part. The negative part was, you know, markets are only so big. And, you know, when people come in, you start carving it up. And then, and then it becomes sort of a, a market share battle, and eventually one person usually prevails. But, I mean, until you win, hopefully you win, you know, the economics take a hit. There are a couple of ways we can grow. One is we can continue to do the large format property in the markets that make sense. We also have a smaller prototype that makes sense in secondary markets where you don't have the population density or the corporate. Um, and we're in the process of, of running that app pretty aggressively. So are you eyeing international growth? We are. You know, I think there's a, a lot of interest in Americana. And maybe even if it isn't overt USA, it's American culture. So, uh, 
you know, we're in the process of exploring which markets would be most receptive to it and then figuring out which local uh, people to partner with to, to roll it out. Are there any cultures around the world that happen to love American bowling? It's gone through phases, so it was really big in Japan back in the 70s and really big in Korea and China in the 80s, but the traditional sport, bowling, I don't know that anyone's done anything along these lines in any great depth in those markets. Where is your dream area that you would love to expand to globally? Uh, you know, one of the big glamorous cities, so London or Hong Kong or Moscow, I think would be really cool. I'm guessing you're a pretty good bowler. Were you going to show, show me your moves? Do you have any tips for a novice bowler? It's the middle two I fingers. Have. The middle two. I've just been doing it there wrong you. the whole time. You want to support the wrist and then you want to walk up. That's looking really good. But that was a very respectable ball. I'm Gigi Stone. Thanks for watching Bloomberg Enterprise.